Um, oh, I know. I could should mention after the talk and after questions and answers and discussion, we could also have time for other local chapter just business or informal whatever people have to say. Yeah. Very end tonight. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the way, for those of us who haven't been with us before, that's what we typically do is, uh, unlike our previous, uh, when we were in all together, uh, when we had our chapter meeting first, we sort of do our chapter meeting last. So we'll have Vicki talk, and then after the talk, um, we'll ha she can ask any, or answer any questions. Um, and so uh, I'll ask you, any, the audience members, anybody who has a question, to just uh, type it in the uh, chat or Q&A. And then um, I will read those questions to Vicki uh, after the talk and she'll answer them. So with that, I'll introduce Vicki Jackson, who has been a longtime member of uh, the Coma Coulson chapter uh, and uh, is an ecologist here, or was an ecologist, still is an ecologist uh, here in the Northwest. And um, she uh, spends part of her year in uh, Arizona, which is where she happens to be now. And of course, she's there doing a lot of botanizing and studying ecology there. And she's going to talk today to us about uh, ramblings in the Sonoran Desert and what she's seen there and some of the ecology um, that she's looked at. Vicki. Thanks. Well, thank you all for coming this evening um, in Zoomlandia here. Um, I am speaking to you from Southern Arizona in the little town of Ajo, Arizona. I'll introduce you to that a little bit later. Um, this evening, I will, I'll just kind of show my face here for a moment, but once we go on to the shared screen, just in order to save some bandwidth, I'm going to disappear uh, and you'll just hear my voice until the end of the presentation. And hopefully the pictures, uh, the pretty pictures are prettier than looking at my mug on the face here anyway. <laughs> um, so I'm going to pop up our screen here. me away. So um, what I'd like to do this evening is to introduce you to an area I've gotten to know quite well. Um, I retired from being a wetland ecologist a couple years ago and um, life has kind of gotten in the way between COVID and my mother's health and a variety of other things. But this is really the first year in which my husband and I have been able to come down here and pretty much spend the whole winter down in Ajo um, with the plans to be back up in the Northwest coming, um, uh, this coming summer. Um, so in that, we've gotten kind of used to, trying to get used to the cadence of being in a small town in the middle of absolutely any or nowhere, essentially. Um, so we can get this to behave. Now, when I put this together, I had a bit of a virtual field trip for you folks, but uh, forgetting that I'm living in the really the middle of nowhere and the internet is really, really poor. We, um, I slid in some videos that aren't really working. So I want you all to put on your imagination hats. And right now you're driving down this desert road. Um, this is a, the back road scenes of uh, back behind Ajo. And this is our trusty trooper, Susie, as we're going down a pretty well-maintained road in this particular case. Um, in fact, this road was uh, just upgraded because of the border wall construction. Usually this is just a, a death trap of washboards. So that's the plus side of the border wall. I won't go any further into that whole topic. <laughs> um, Ajo, Arizona is located in this tiny little area right down here. Uh, we've got the state of Arizona here. We're down below Phoenix and Tucson and uh, the city Yuma is over here. And uh, down here is the international uh, border with Mexico and the Sea of Cortez right down here. So it uh, is a, a wonderful kind of place to be completely away from everything. I'm having some problems with my thing going forward. Um, a little bit about that, you do a little promo of Ajo, Arizona. And hopefully the slides are progressing with my talk. We're having some delay problems, so um, 
forgive me if that's happening. I can't tell at my end. Um, Ajo, Arizona is an old mining town. It was a copper mining town that was um, active from the late 1800s until the mid uh, 1980s, kind of somewhere between 88 and 89, uh, the mine closed. Uh, since that time, the town has kind of suffered in terms of having no economy, um, but has been working very hard to become more of a semi-tourist destination <laughs> uh, for those that like the, the desert wilderness. And it's kind of an artist town, which of course, something I enjoy. Um, it has beautiful Spanish colonial uh, architecture and kind of a central plaza. Uh, here's an old mission from the early 1800s. Here's the mine itself, um, the Cornelia new Cornelia mine. It's massive and it does leave a scar across the landscape, but it's a good reminder of what us humans can do. Uh, here's just kind of a touch. There's a lot of murals in our town and we have a whole, couple of little alleys that are filled with them. It's an awesome thing. And here's just kind of a view in the, uh, the plaza area too. It's just a, a wonderful place, but it's not really the reason my husband and I are attracted to this spot. Uh, that is more related to where this is located. And Ajo is in literally the middle of nowhere, center of everywhere for, for us. Um, it is desert wilderness for hundreds of thousands of, um, thousands of acres around us. Ajo on this map is tucked right here. The purple area you see around this is all uh, BLM land. We all freely accessible um, at any time and we can wander out there on foot or in lots of um, old mining roads and ranching roads that, that are just uh, dirt roads back there. It's definitely for the road country. Uh, to the east or to the west of us is the Cabeza Prieta National Ref uh, Wildlife Refuge, which is a, a massive refuge that extends essentially from Ajo all the way to Yuma. And this area is very little roaded. Um, the roads that are on there are primarily geared towards um, administration roads. And there's just a few of them that are open to vehicles, but private vehicles. You do need a permit to get in there, but it's an easy permit to get. And we spend a fair amount of time on the fringes of the Cabeza area to get there. And it's a tremendous, wonderful area. And tucked down here between the Cabeza Prieta and uh, the BLM land is Oregon Pike National Monument. And anybody that's visited down in this neck of the woods has probably been there. Um, Oregon Pipe is uh, not named after a cactus that I'll introduce you to in a, in a moment, which has its um, northern range extending up into this area. And then um, to the south is the Pinacate Biosphere Reserve in Mexico, which is another massive um, protected wilderness area in Mexico. We've only touched into a little bit of it. It includes um, a huge crater kind of complex that's in there that is phenomenal, huge volcanic craters that are just, I can't even, I didn't actually include them in this slideshow because that's a whole different talk. And then as you go east or west, um, you end up into a huge sand dune complex that bumps into the Sea of Cortez. So it's beautiful. And to the north is the Barry Goldwater Air Force Range, which sounds intimidating, but it is a huge area that's been protected. Um, and yes, they do use parts of it for active bombing and, and maneuvering, but it also, most of it is accessible to public with a, um, a permit, which is also easy to get. And we, we love going up in that area. It's kind of our favorite area. And then to the far east, um, of the BLM lands and the, the, the range are the, the Tohono O'odham um, tribal reservation, which is another large wilderness area of uh, tribal lands, which is phenomenal in there. A little more dicey to get into those areas because they are protective of them as they should be. But uh, this is kind of the center of our universe and we spend a lot of time basically running around in, with our uh, four wheel drive and going cross country across the areas in here. This is supposed to be a video, but um, this will give you a sense of what's going on. This is right behind our town. I call this the back 40. Um, this gives you a good sense of the, the landscape in the area. We are in the Basin and Range province. 
So you can see here real clearly, we have a lot of basin, the low areas and a lot of the ranges. Um, and the ranges vary from usually around 3,000 feet. Um, some of them are in 1,000 feet uh, down to the, the lower elevations in here, maybe around 800. So it, uh, it's, we're still kind of set up high. But the, that elevational gradient, gradient is really important in terms of the kinds of plants and speciation that we see in this area. I thought before I go any further, I'd just, just give a little primer on what a desert is and introduce you to the Sonoran Desert specifically. Um, and like anything, if we talked about you know, any botanical term or any scientific term, there's always a lot of discussion and splitters and lumpers. Um, what is a desert? Well, basically it comes down to the, that the amount of evaporation and transpiration coming from plants exceeds the amount of water coming down in precipitation. Um, there's a really simplified version of that. And that, you know, there's a lot of different landscapes that fits that doesn't include probably the Pacific Northwest as we know, at least on the west side. Um, but most deserts receive less than 10 inches of rain on an annual basis. In our area, in, um, the Sonoran, it's about eight inches on average, but they can vary. In fact, last year it was three inches. We're in a drought right here. And it's really dramatically, you can see the difference and you'll see some pictures today about the difference between a drought year and the last few years that we've had that have been heavy precipitation years and where they're just a garden down here. Um, there are a number of deserts in the United States. Um, there are, if you're a splitter, there's way more than I've listed on here but I'm keeping it simple. <laughs> and uh, to begin with, we have the, the Great Basin Desert, which is considered a cold desert. It basically is dominated by a, a northern latitude. It has a short season, high elevation, and the cold temperatures really kind of dominate what's going on there. But it also is exposed to a lot of um, very hot temperatures during the summer. Uh, the dominating, dominating plants in that desert in the Great Basin are low shrubs and herbaceous plants. You don't really see trees except for in riparian areas. And sagebrush is the kind of major dominating plant of the landscape. Um, as we move south, things warm up and we have the, the hot deserts. The Chihuahuan Desert is the largest of the deserts and it just kisses the United States. It's mainly in Mexico. And it uh, comes into the southern parts of New Mexico and Texas. And it is a, a, a desert that's kind of um, geared towards a, a lower elevation, still has some hard freezes, but really high hot temperatures. And it, one thing that's very distinctive about it, it is a wet season that happens during the summer, not so much during any other time of year. It's a monsoon system um, fed. Uh, one that probably a lot of you have visited in Southern California is the Mojave Desert, which is a higher elevation desert and kind of fits almost in that cold desert range, but it gets super hot there too. Um, and the Mojave Desert's our smallest desert, if we don't include what we can call the, the, um, the Painted Desert is another separate one that's in the Four Corners area. But uh, the Mojave is a, a wetter, situation, it gets winter rains, and uh, it uh, has primarily lower shrub uh, herbaceous plants. Um, but it is the iconic yucca, um, the Joshua tree is kind of the icon of the, the Mojave Desert and occurs pr pretty much just in the Mojave. Um, and then the last one we'll talk about is the Sonoran Desert, which is the one that we're located in. Um, map here that gives you a sense of where it's located. The mustard color is the general perimeters of the Sonoran Desert. Now with all things out in nature, one desert abutting another desert, there's not a line. It's all a gradation. And when you move from the, the Mojave Desert down to the Sonoran Desert, you don't really know when it happens. It, you, you have the yucca trees and saguaros and things mix, mixing together and it's very confusing. Same thing with the Chihuahuan Desert. But these are the lines that they've drawn essentially. So basically um, the Sonoran Desert extends from kind of the southern half of Arizona 
kisses California, slides down Baja, California, and dominates it, and then also comes down the um, east side of the Sea of Cortez as well. Um, Ajo is located right here again, and so we're kind of in the heart of that, uh, uh, the heart of the upper part of the whole Sonoran system. The Sonoran is really unique in that it has a, a weather pattern that defines essentially the biota that's here. And uh, instead of having a single rainy season, the, this, the Sonoran Desert is known for its double rainy season. It essentially has five seasons. It has a uh, starting out with the spring, which we're in right now, um, is can be you know, intermittently wet, um, comfortable temperatures, perfect for people this time of year. Um, until we hit, oh, about mid-April, and then the dry summer starts kicking in. And that extends into about mid-July, and that is hot and dry, no rain expected. Um, temperatures go soaring up into the hundreds and gets a bit uncomfortable. And then about mid-July, if we're lucky, the monsoon systems come in from the Gulf of Mexico and they start feeding huge storms coming through. And the summer rains uh, called monsoon storms are an important part of the whole ecology here. Now, last year they didn't happen, hence our drought year, and uh, throws everything kind of in a, a mess here. But uh, normally we have a, a couple months of that monsoon se season and it starts simmering down in October when the, the Sonoran fall happens where the monsoons start disappearing. There is a little bit of rain. The temperatures start cooling down but aren't um, nearly as, uh, as high as they were. It still can be a bit uncomfortable um, until about uh, November. And then things kind of, they, it's kind of considered the Sonoran winter from November through January. Really, my experience, I'd say, is December and January is the only winter here. And then we get temperatures that sit in the 50s during the day, with you know, times we will drop into the 40s or 30s for brief amounts of time. And uh, that is our second big rain period. And that basically in the winter, um, the rains in the Sonoran can be very much like the Pacific Northwest. You can have a week of just drizzly, rainy, gray skies, um, cool temperatures, and you'd feel right at home there. And then it'll break, and then you have a few days, it'll soar up to 70 degrees and you'll be all comfortable again, and then it'll kind of seep back in. Those winter rains are really important to really uh, kind of uh, water and irrigate all the little annual plants. And we talk about a spring super bloom, it's those winter rains that are super important in terms of um, making sure that you have that bloom. And of course, this year, we don't have that. Um, the Sonoran Desert also, uh, besides having this double rainfall thing, ends up being kind of dominated by species that have a tropical or subtropical origin. And the Sonoran Desert has the greatest diversity of vegetation species of any desert in the world with up to about 560 different plant species. It's pretty phenomenal. And I've just touched, you know, I, I'm just learning every day about these guys. Um, I was gonna begin with uh, to the, oops, I wasn't gonna hit that. There's a video going on there and I think it's gonna mess things up. But, uh, introduce you to a couple biomes that are in our area in particular. The Sonoran Desert has a number of different biomes, but the dominant ones that are in the kind of Ajo area, Phoenix and Tucson, um, basically are the highland areas and up on the hills and the ranges are the Arizona uplands. And these are the areas when you think of, close your eyes and imagine being in the desert, um, this is where the cacti are. This is where the real plant diversity becomes kind of dazzling. Um, versus the Colorado River vegetation, which is down in the ravine areas. And it's a little more monotonous, but not, no less of more, it's still very important. Um, this is a picture here or video, but I won't run the video here, about just in our back 40 here this year. Um, so this, I took this last week. And you can see there's a lot of diversity of plants here. It's all very, brown gray toned with a little green tinge in there. And that primarily is um, because the drought, the 
is going to look very different from a wet spring. Um, in this picture here, you can see a little cactus pointing right here. This is a buckhorn thorn choya. This is triangular bursage. Here's a palo verde, which we'll talk all about these plants a little later here. The saguaro, um, the iconic cactus of the saguaro desert here is right there. And uh, you can just see the, the rocky terrain that's in here. And this is kind of typical walk through the desert here. No trail, just start walking. And yes, you do get poked and you do get cactus spines stuck to you. And um, basically our motto is everything's trying to kill you, but it's a good time still. This is a spring picture, um, a dramatic difference. And actually this is spring before the uh, little ground annuals had taken off. I think this is from last year. Um, the last two years have been really phenomenal nice years with a lot of good rainfall. And uh, it's just a very lush, green, beautiful place when this happens. So it's, you know, interesting seeing the drought period and kind of seeing how things adjust and um, adapt to it. But it's also very hard because you know how green this place can really be. Uh, when we're talking about the Sonoran uplands and when we talk about Arizona or deserts in general, people first of all think of cacti. Um, and certainly in our area, we have a lot of cacti. And uh, some of them are really difficult to tell apart and I'm still trying to figure my head, get my head around it. Um, some are really obvious, but here we have four different species right in this shot here. The front here is one of the hedgehog cactuses. This is a fishhook barrel cactus here. The saguaro right here, or three saguaros right there. Another barrel cactus, and this is an Oregon pipe cactus right there. Um, and we're gonna just spend a few minutes just going through and I'll introduce you really quickly the different species that are here. And you're certainly just to give you a taste of what it's like and what you can find around here. Um, of course, the uh, most iconic plant out here is the saguaro. And it's the huge columnar cactus that can grow here because we don't have heavy frosts and we do have mild temperatures and they can survive all those and become these giants. Uh, the middle picture there, that's my husband. He's 6'5". This is the largest saguaro we've run into. It was kind of in the Cabeza Prieta Reserve. And uh, it was just a monster. We just ran into that a couple of weeks ago. But you can see from him reaching around there, this is not a small plant. How old that plant is, I don't know. Saguaros can live well over 200 years. It's, they're slow growing, slowish growing. And uh, so this one might be a mature 200 year old tree or plant. Um, you can see at the top, there was all kinds of arms that were sticking all over the top of that one. Um, if you look at the, uh, the ends of any of these arms and the tops of the Saguaro cactus come May and early June, you'll see the cactus, their flowers, which are phenomenal. And these will turn into a red fruit, which are a very important food to the, the Tohono O'odham and before them, the Hokum people that were here and uh, used for pre preserving and used for all kinds of food types. And today still people, not only native, native people, but people, locals here go out and collect them. Um, you can see in this other picture here that the cactuses have a lot of different forms and you can be endlessly entertained walking through the desert here, just getting naming every cactus and giving them personality. It never looks, you know, they all look a little different. Some have arms, some have none. Um, the, the older they are, the more likely they ha are, have arms, but some populations seem to never have arms. So it's very confusing. Um, and it doesn't seem to be well known why that is. Uh, here's a picture, another picture of the saguaro. Uh, you can see here it has this pleated kind of uh, texture. And that's basically an adaptation to allow it to expand and contract based on how much moisture is um, storing in its tissue. This freshly fallen um, giant, you can see this tissue that's between this core and the center this is more its vascular area and this outer part here, um, this is the part where it basically it stores not loose water. You can't cut open a cactus and get a barrel of water. All that water is captured up into that tissue material. And as it gets fuller, those pleaters, pleats just spread on out and become kind of very subtle. 
And then <clears throat> like a dry year now, year, um, particularly when we got here and they hadn't had any rain for a long time, um, they just shrink into these little sticks with these pleats around the edges of them with lots of thorns, of course. Um, the cactus itself and most of the cactuses have very little root uh, mass. This is one at the other end of this guy here. And for given the size of these things, they have very small roots. Um, what they do have is they, they lack a tap root, but it's sort of like I envision like a fishing net spread across the whole surface of shallow part of the um, soils around a cactus and that's their root system. When the rain comes down, those uh, roots are right there, ready to grab that precipitation and, and that moisture really quickly and take it up into those plants and grab it fast. And they're adapted to deal with these soils where the water is easy to pull off those soil um, pieces. They don't do well in the fine soils that are down in the um, lower basin areas. So you see very fewer of them in there. We see them up in this Arizona uplands or Pajada is another name for it. Um, where the soils are drained better. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we have the Western Red Cedar as being kind of our iconic tree that everything was used for, and it's important in terms of the ecology of the forest and the people that were are, are tied to it. Uh, the saguaro cactus is very similar to that. And here, um, this is kind of an example of how they tie into the other parts of the ecology. This little bird here called the Gila woodpecker and another cousin, the gilded woodpecker. Um, in our, these guys are just ecosystems engineers digging holes constantly in these saguaros. And when a hole is dug by one of these woodpeckers and a, a cavity is made in there, the sap on the inside of the tree kind of firms up into this um, shell and it is forms what we call a cactus boot. And there's a little hole and the, the birds can go in and out and they use them as nesting cavities and also just um, night roosts as well and, and shelters from the heat as well. So um, they build far more the, of these holes and cavities than they ever can use. And what happens is lots of other organisms, such uh, particularly the little owls of the desert out here, use them for their nesting cavities, just as a pileated woodpecker does in our Pacific Northwest um, forests. So they're, they're pretty cool. Um, another cactus that we see here in our area, but you don't see further north, is organ pipe, uh, organ pipe uh, cactus. And this is another huge, large columnar cactus, but this one's a multi-stemmed one. So out of one base, you have all of these arms coming out of their giant octopus. Um, they uh, tend to grow fairly, they're very frost sensitive, so they're on the south sides of slopes and are uh, very selective about where they want to grow. But uh, Oregon Pipe National Monument in particular is just a, an amazing show of these particular plants. Uh, I put this picture in here. Um, you'll often hear down, you know, looking at cactuses, people talk about crested saguaros, which was our previous plant. Um, but this is a crested organ pipe, cristate, Formation is another biological term for it. It's basically a, an irregular growth of the plant, the plant forming these really interesting patterns. And I found this one just to be an absolutely beautiful organ pipe um, form here. And they don't know why they cause, how this happens, but it doesn't seem to cause any problem to the plant. They seem to move along just fine and they'll get to be old, old plants with these formations on them. But I, I love fun, finding them. Uh, another cactus, which is less common and a little more obscure, these get about maybe watermelon size, but I, I absolutely love them. This is my husband's favorite cactus. This is Emery's barrel cactus. And this uh, just has a beautiful colored green bare skin under these beautiful red um, thorns that are sticking out around them. And they're just a, a stunning little guy. Uh, this guy, I took this picture today. This is the first cactus flower of our season. Um, this was right along the border, um, right along the border wall. <laughs> uh, this is the California barrel cactus. Um, and these guys are, they get maybe as tall as me, about five feet, you know, three to five feet full grown. They're very kind of, kind of like a spider web went around them and covered them with spines. 
And this is the first time I've ever seen them flower. Um, and they have a beautiful little pale yellow flower that was on the top. And just a few of them were starting to, to come out. So I was really excited to see those guys. On very gravelly um, granite soil, these are very distinctive and different. Uh, this little guy here is a pin, one of the pincushion cactuses, and these guys, oops, back up. These uh, are very small. They're about um, six inches or three inches. They can be very tiny. They're usually growing in bedrock. They're tied, they'll be tucked in. You won't really even notice them until you notice the brilliant little flowers, which should be flowering very soon here, one of our early flowers. And uh, then they have a red fruit afterwards might notice also right here is a club moss. And yes, there are club mosses in the desert. And there are a lot of them on the rocky slopes. They're very good at hydrating during a, after a storm and water. And then they just shrivel up and kind of disappear until the next wet period. And uh, it can be mesmerizing seeing the side of a, a mountain just covered with these club mosses um, after some rains. And one of our all time favorite plants around here is the adorable but vicious teddy bear choya. Um, these guys cover the hillsides. They're stunning to look at. Um, the backlighting on them can be amazing, but boy, those guys, they have little, what we call them pups or cubs. They're little vegetative reproductive things that fall off and they grab a hold of you anywhere. And you just, my husband in particular, standing in the middle of those, um, they'll catch him every time. And so he's always got him stuck to his feet or leg or whatever. But uh, for all of their fuzzy showiness on the upper part here, their flowers are pretty indistinct. They, they flower fairly late around here. It seems to me it's around April-ish, early May, they start to show up. Um, these subtle little white yellow flowers. And this is a fruit on them over here. And uh, they uh, also have prickles and those fruits will attach to a vector like my husband or a passing coyote and be moved on along and uh, start a new colony. In the background, you can see some wild cactuses behind them. Uh, another common one here, which is a, an important um, plant uh, in terms of the native peoples. This is the buckthorn choya. And uh, this one was used as a, an important food gathering plant in the spring. The little flower buds that are up here are collected and apparently taste like asparagus and just steamed and eaten. Um, I haven't yet tried them and I won't this year because there's just not that many of them. But I think that next year, hopefully, I'll get to try them. They have quite the flower shows of kind of yellow and russet colored ones and the whole hillsides can be glowing with these. Um, they're beautiful cactus and they don't tend to be quite as scary as some of the other choyas that are out there. Um, my sister Lynn, who I think is listening, um, <laughs> is showing off this other uh, large choya. Um, there's a lot of different choyas. Uh, this is the jumping or uh, chain choya and they get quite tall and they get black undersides here and they get kind of scary looking with their kind of grotesque formations. And then what you see drooping down here over these edges are their fruits that you see on the side. And those fruits will um, drop off and spread the uh, forest. And typically when you see some jumping choyas, there'll be a lot of jumping choyas in an area. But typically you see walk through because you can walk under them <laughs> and not get attacked too badly. Uh, moving to a relative of the choya, uh, choyas and prickly pears are closely related, um, is our most common one, prickly pear in our area is the Engelmann's prickly pear. Um, there are a lot of different species of prickly pears, um, and even in Sonoran, there are a number of different species. But this is pretty much in our area the only one you will see. They're very well armed. Um, they uh, yeah, the pads are not something you want to get into and uh, have a, a snack off of, but you will see that uh, javelinas and uh, the rabbits around here will eat them readily. They flower beautifully. Um, I think in June-ish, seems to me we've seen them about that time, but I can't remember what time exactly. But uh, beautiful yellow flowers and they turn into a red fruit, which is edible, and people enjoy making um, wines out of them and jellies in that area. 
Um, the cactus, you don't see very many prickly pear in our area particularly, but if you go in the areas that have been grazed a lot, the areas will, the prickly pears aren't eaten by the cattle, they get spread because these pads can be re-sprouting as soon as they hit the ground. And since the cattle will ignore them, they can dominate a landscape and they're often a good indicator of how well that area has been managed for, for grazing. Uh, one of our, the Nichols hedgehog cactus uh, is just about ready to bloom here and it's a showstopper. These, uh, Cactus themselves are no, no higher than knee high on me, but those flowers are about the size of my fist. And that fuchsia color, and I, I can never walk by without taking pictures. They must have 3 million pictures of these guys in there, but they're absolutely beautiful. And they grow really well, again, up on these upper Bajada um, or is it Arizona Highland areas. Uh, just a little quick peek on the inside of the cactuses to give you an idea. This is a saguaro skeleton. They have these series of little poles that come up through them, and those are kind of line up with the ribs. This is a choya cactus skeleton. It has all these little holes all over. It's really beautiful. And over here is the organ pipe, um, which is a bunch of sticks that are going to flop all over again, with like an octopus sitting there. Um, but it's interesting what holds these guys up. Now, to move out of the, the, the hillsides are not just dominated by cactus. They are, is a whole ecosystem of cool stuff. And one of my very, very favorite things is the elephant tree. Again, another species that's really at its northern range where we're located. And uh, so it's a treat to find them here. And I've been finding more and more of them. I finally get my eyes trained to them. Um, these are a member of the sandalwood uh, family. And if you crush these leaves, and they have the most amazing smell. They're just kind of like a lemony camphor smell. And I could just sniff it all day long. Um, the plants call it elephant tree because they have these inflated moisture absorbing trunks that are on them. Um, in their southern part of their range further south in Mexico, these things get to be huge trees um, and big, huge trunks that look more like elephant feet. Um, but here they're only about six, eight feet. Um, the frost tends to nip them off at the top. Um, these are a dioecious plant. So there's male and female plants. The female plants will have these fruits. These are last year's fruits that have dried on there, but they're a blue colored berry um, when they're in the prime and ready to, to be spread by a bird, I imagine. Uh, this is just one out in the wild there and looking pretty and it was a video, but we won't do that today. Um, Ironwood is a very important part of the desert landscape here. It's a large tree that can get 30 or 40, feet high, or, um, particularly in a riparian or wash area. Um, you have whole forests of these that are interspersed on these hillsides, and uh, they are an important shelter and food plant for a lot of organisms. Um, all of the trees down here, hopefully you can't, I don't know if you can hear it, but there's coyotes yelling in the background right now. Um, there is, uh, all of these are in the, the pea family, and they, I don't have a picture of their beautiful little pea blue flower, but it's adorable. This is their fruit here, which is just like a little pea pod with one fruit in it. Um, very scaly. A uh, <clears throat> very prominent shrub tree that's in our area is the Palo Verde. There's a few different species that are in the area or in kind of the Sonoran Desert, the foothill Palo Verde being the most common in our area. Uh, these are interesting and the way they adapt to the desert conditions is they quickly, they have teeny tiny little leaves when they do have the leaves um, that uh, help them reduce how much moisture is being left. As soon as it gets hot and they lose moisture, they drop those leaves and they can fully photosynthesize with the bark on their trees. They're just bright green. Um, their flowers are beautiful yellow and in April, and these are in prime form, the hillsides would be covered like daffodil yellow with these guys. Um, important in terms of structure, um, cover for uh, other plants and, and food sources for a lot of different animals. On these plants, you often see mistletoe out here. Desert mistletoe is really common um, it is a stress on the plants that are on them, but uh, it's part of the ecology here. They have very reduced little leaves that are growing here and these beautiful little berries. 
And they're spread from tree to tree to tree and shrub to shrub to shrub by this little bird here. And this is a silky flycatcher called the Phenopepala. This is a male. Um, they're black, beautiful, shiny, and the females are kind of a gray color. And they're beautiful little birds, but they feed almost exclusively on the, the desert mistletoe of berries. Um, and they spread them around. Uh, one of my favorite plants, uh, and it is not just a Sonoran plant, you'll find this in the Mojave Desert, and I think it extends into the Chihuahuan. It doesn't really get into the Great Basin, but this is the Acatillo, and uh, it's just a bizarre plant. Uh, it essentially to me looks like an octopus with its head stuck in the ground and all these crazy legs all over the place. Um, during the wet season, these will have all these beautiful little green leaves here. Um, hiding these dagger-like spines that are all over it. Again, everything's trying to kill you. Um, they have these brilliant flowers, sprays of flower, and you can see them on the top of this plant here as well. Um, they have big blooms in the spring with these, and then they kind of bloom any time of the year beyond that, but usually just a flower or two um, on the plant rather than a whole big show of them. And hummingbirds are the main pollinators on these guys. but awesome plants. And uh, now when the dry season hits, they lose all their leaves and the next rain, they'll grow them back and they can grow on and off about five times during the year, apparently. Uh, this is just kind of a desert scene here in our back 40 again behind the uh, Ajo. Uh, we have the saguaro cactus. Uh, this is probably one of the chain choyas, not a teddy bear choya. Uh, this is creosote, which you'll meet a little later. Here's the uh, acatillo, but it is uh, not in leaf there. It's looking just kind of scraggly. And this is prior young ironwood there. And here it is during a really wet year. I think this was last year. And uh, this is a, a split leaf phacelia or purple stem phacelia, two different couple common names. Uh, that is just covering the landscape here. You can see the cactus are full and fleshy. This is organ pipe again, a saguaro over here, and uh, one of the chain choyas here probably. And uh, this is creosote bush. But you can see the difference between those two pictures, between a dry year and a moist year. Uh, so I thought I'd just introduce you to some of the small annual flowers that we're not going to see here this year, um, other than the sprinkling in particularly wet spots. But uh, these covered the desert floor for the last couple years. And so I'm missing them dearly. This is a Mojave Desert Star, just a belly flower, very short and adorable. Purple mat, which can just cover the desert flo uh, floor and become brilliantly purple. Uh, the purple stem phacelia, which you just saw um, in that previous picture, which is a, a stunning plant. Uh, then again, the phacelia there, and this is a uh, white tax stem, which is a pretty little composite. Uh, the desert rose mallow is just a beautiful, large flower, a couple inches across, and usually found in washes or canyons, not so much in the open bare areas. Um, Heartleaf suncup um, and brittle bush which brittle bush is a really important ground cover and it's a perennial. These others have been uh, more of an annual plant. These are brittle, this one's a perennial plant. And this will cover whole hillsides and makes up its own ecosystem or little biome by itself. And there's a little interesting fruit fly on this one. I forgot the name of it, I looked it up. Um, rock hibiscus, uh, the evening, desert evening, Primrose, which uh, opens in the evening and is there in the morning and then closes in the day. One of my favorites is the stand, sand blazing star, which I never see in the sand. I always see up in the gravelly bajadas, but uh, just a beautiful little uh, spray of these white flowers on, in a clump, typically. Uh, this is not an annual, um, but this is a really important plant. The honey mesquite and also the velvet mesquite that looks very much like it are really important um, food plants for animals and also for Native Americans and early settlers. The, the beans, the mesquite beans of those were ground and used as a food for people and uh, still are today. Uh, pollinators are a real important part of this whole desert uh, 
seen and I could whole, have a whole talk on them themselves, but I thought I'd just throw in this pretty painted lady on a silky on a facilia again. And this little bristly calico is just like an inch tall, just a beautiful. A lot of these annuals are just teeny tiny little plants that you have to really stop and spend some time with. Um, one of my favorite places to go if you get down here is Alamo Canyon. This again was going to be a video and it's going to take you a little walk on there, but basically it's a, a there's huge rock walls around the edges. There's a nice trail going into it. And then you just can go as far as you want up um, washes for quite some distance um, and enjoying different kinds of geology and all the plants along them. And in a wet year, there'll be water there. Um, which here's a picture here of last year in Alamo Canyon. And this was filled with um, all kinds of macroinvertebrates and tadpoles to make me very happy of the red spotted toad. Um, these, a lot of these plants in here were just going to be turned into monkey flowers. The yellow monkey flowers were just phenomenal through this whole area. Um, the wash is home to some beautiful shrubs, the jojoba that we get jojoba oil from. And uh, they're an evergreen shrub that's very beautiful. The pink fairy dusters are these, have these little low shrubs that have these beautiful little pinnate flower, um, leaves on them, nasty little thorns, but uh, have a beautiful flower show on them. It has a nice scent too. And this was a video of a, there's a hawk moth feeding on these Cecilia plants right here, but we'll just have to look at that one. <laughs> um, the washes and the canyons are beautiful places for shrubs such as the Chupa Rosa. And uh, here's my sister enjoying and taking some photographs of this. It's, uh, I never can walk past one of these particular bushes. They put on quite a show and pollinators of all sorts are attracted to them. But of course they're designed more for a hummingbird than for a honeybee. This is probably an Africanized honeybee here and they are a bit of a hazard here. We ran into a hive today. Luckily, we saw it before it saw us. Um, going up some of the washes, here's an, one of the unusual plants that I've run into. This is called a live forever plant, Dudleya. And uh, apparently, they live forever. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's not really true. But I only know of them growing in one spot down here, and it's on a vertical canyon wall um, that we just randomly went walking up off trail just to discover. And that has been one of our favorite washes, including petroglyphs and um, watering holes and all kinds of uh, cool plants up in that. So it's uh, one of our favorite places to go. But this, this plant is in particular wonderful. You also notice that there's a fern here and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, some other flower shows here, trailing windmills. This little plant will grow right along the rock and uh, trail and flowers will just sprinkle all the way across the rock face. Uh, this bare stem locks, lark spur, spur, not spurt, um, will be growing in moist pockets up on where water catches on the hillsides. <clears throat> the snapdragon vine I only ran into once it was growing up in the shrubs <clears throat> in one of these washes and uh, it is just absolutely stunning plant. Uh, this is a look, when I talked about the Berry Goldwater Range, the airport is north of us. This is one of the areas you can have a permit to enter. It's called the Craters Range, not because craters that they bombed, but these are old volcanic craters. And most of the ranges here are um, volcanic in nature, nature. These are uh, huge historic, prehistoric, um, kinds of uh, volcanic action that happened here and has created amazing rock formations and hence a lot of mining because of the, the minerals in those areas. But uh, this particular canyon we found uh, this year, we hadn't found, been in this area before and it was a phenomenal box canyon that we just wandered into off trail and found this place and it's just magical. Uh, the green plants that you see in here, all the bright green, these are all Palo Verdes, the little Palo Verdes sprinkled all the way across here, saguaros. Um, the uh, teddy bear choya is very common, and I think that's glowing on the hillside over there. Um, we were standing right about in this area, and we watched a gray fox just come behind a rock and go straight up a wall. It was pretty amazing. Um, we saw some, a variety of different cool critters back in this particular area. But it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, example of the landscapes in this general area. 
a uh, couple more flowers and some pollinators. Uh, this is a spreading flea bang, usually seeing them in wet, moist areas. This one actually made a vent through a, next to a water hole um, up in the variable water range again with a ornate checker beetle on it. It's a beautiful little guy. And then uh, the, the Coulter is globe mallow. There's a lot of globe mallows down here. This is an annual um, and in it here is a little sweat bee. And uh, these bees will actually curl up and sleep in the flower. They Flowers close at night and then open, and the bees will just get nestled inside of those during the night. And in the morning, you'll see them sleeping around the, the stamens. It's really adorable. Um, some other flowers here, the purple oil, uh, owl's clover. Um, in a good year, there can be just fields of this that cover the hillsides along with the California poppy. And here's just kind of a taste of that in this location. Um, this was up in the Berry Gold Water Range last year as well. Uh, Cinchweed, uh, kind of a shrubby almost plant and uh, just a colorful place and you usually, usually find a lot of cool pollinators on this shot missed any. Uh, desert thorn apple or datura, uh, sacred datura is another name and view that flower is about three inches across, they're very, very large. We usually see them in more waste areas, um, not so much up in the rocky areas, so I'm kind of in the wrong spot on my show here. But. Arizona lupins can be very prolific and also just put on a show and cover the, the ground on a super blue mirror. This year, I'm only seeing them in the cracks of pavement where the water's collected. <laughs> uh, New Mexican thistle and some longhorn beetles uh, having fun there. The desert mariposa lily, uh, brilliant, absolutely stunning plant. And California poppy again. We also have the Mexican poppy, but somehow I couldn't find any photos and stuff of it. Ferns. There are ferns in the desert. And uh, here's a variety of four different species that we saw up in Oregon Pipe National Monument this, just this year. And it was in the Bull Pasture Trail. And we have this beautiful spiny cliff break that was a beautiful, delicate looking creature. The star cloak for fern, which I see a lot in any of the rocky areas, um, they tuck into the little rock crevices. It's a really common one. Scaly cloak fern, really pretty. And then fairy swords, which are just almost icy blue. And they make these look only mats of them that grow um, in solid mats along the base of the rocks. So it's really fun to see these guys. Now, when it dries up, this, these are only active and open and uh, being a fern, I guess during the, the wet, after a rain. And then as soon as it dries up again, they curl up and turn into little brown knobs and you easily could miss them. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, one, yep. So all of the plants that we've been showing, those are all up in the upper Arizona kind of uplands or the Bajada areas, gravelly soils, rocky soils. But as you move into those, those basins, those low areas between those ranges, you get really fine soils. They're clays and silts, and very fine sands, and the water gets into those areas and you know it all drains that direction. But those kinds of soils, the water holds onto really tightly. It's hard for a plant to get the water away from the soil. So you have less diversity down there and you have some really stubborn plants essentially, but really important ecologies that are in them. And what you're looking at here is um, creosote flat, is what I call it. Um, these are creosote bushes, and you'll notice the empty spaces between them in through here. Um, the, the plants themselves are, a lot of these may be clones of one another, runners essentially. Uh, a creosote plant can grow, uh, for, live for 100 years plus. Um, the oldest, one of the oldest organisms on the planet are, is a creosote uh, colony that's about thought to be 11,000 years old. So these can be very ancient. Um, and they're important in terms of a lot of organisms like the desert, a lot of lizards and small rodents and foxes will all make their burrows at the base of these things where it's a more stable soil than the areas in between. Um, now the areas in between during a wet year will be a phenomenal flower show. But this year we're not seeing that again. 
Um, here again is the creosotes. Again, this is normal to have all of this space in between here. Um, when you, they're flowering right now, and this is just a little flower on them. They look like a little, you know, typical rose type flower. And uh, they're important food for like the desert iguana eats these, the cottontails and the hares that are out there and uh, pretty much anything that is walking will try to eat those. those. The, uh, the foliage itself has a lot of resins on it and most things will not graze on the, the leaves. Although there's actually a couple of um, grasshoppers that have adapted their whole lives to live on these creosote bushes and that could be a whole talk on itself. Um, here's what it can look like when it's a wet year. And so here is a Coulter's globe, globe mallow again. Um, so close up one earlier, and they can just be thick and beautiful um, in between these flat areas. And uh, it's just, it can be just quite a showstopper. Another plant that one of the cactuses, most cactuses we saw were all up in the book. Is, but if we get into those low, fine soils, there's not very many cactuses that do very well there because of their shallow root systems. Um, this is the Sunita cactus, and this just barely touches um, Oregon Pike National Monument. It doesn't even make it up into Ajo, although they, people have them in their landscapes. Um, it does it range as you move further south into Mexico, it becomes a more common plant. But it's always in these very barren, barren landscapes. This particular picture is from the Pinacate in um, Mexico, and uh, it's a biosphere reserve I was talking about. And here's one of those volcanic craters that's sitting in the background right there. It is a moonscape down there, it is a phenomenal experience. And if you ever come to this area, you've got to go down and visit that when COVID isn't. <laughs> uh, some of the flowers you will also see down here, there that specialize in these soils the desert marigold, beautiful yellow refreshing plant. Uh, the southwestern prickly poppy, um, which also loves roadsides, those kind of hard, harsh environments. Um, the ajo lily, this thing can get about six inches tall, these beautiful white flowers. Um, they'll be just, they're just starting to come up right now and hopefully they'll be blooming in a couple of weeks. I don't think we'll have a great show, but we're definitely gonna have some because I'm seeing the leaves. Another look at the desert marigold, really pretty cheery plant. Um, the fishhook barrel cactus will grow down in these areas and does fairly well and will grow up in the Bajadas. So it's a fairly plastic um, plant and will handle a lot of different things. These bloom in the summer and uh, I had never seen them bloom until I think it was year before last. We came down in July to see if we could handle the heat. We can't. Um, but we saw the barrel cactuses in full bloom and that made it all worth the trip. <laughs> but we're not desert ratty enough to handle 116 degrees that it was down here. Um, what an interesting thing down here, and I don't, people may have heard this before, is desert biocrusts. But on the desert floor, there is these colonies of bacteria and fungi and lichens that uh, essentially pioneer this environment that helps stabilize the desert floor and helps nutrify the desert floor. They're very delicate, um, although they also seem to be a little more resilient than people had initially talked about them. Um, they can be ancient and old, but you also see them along very disturbed edges of washes and things. So clearly there's some resistance. But these areas, when they get wet, um, here is this little liverwort or a crystal wort here that uh, is in this bio crust and all of a sudden blooms out of these areas when it gets wet and saturated. Uh, and uh, they'll, they'll just sponge up and little mosses will be present and they're pretty amazing. This guy here is on the rocks, it's a common, uh, it's a common green shield lichen and there's some beautiful lichens on the different rocks. These aren't necessarily bio crusts, but they are phenomenal colors and important in terms of the, the composition of rock and such. Another oddball, these are all kind of oddballs sitting here, is the desert broom rape. Um, we have our broom rapes up in our neck of the woods. Well, these also um, occur down here and they're, they were a fun surprise to find. I think it's on the first time last year and seem to be parasitic on, I think, the creosote bush, but I'm not positive on that one. And there's also mushrooms down here. Um, this one is the salt shaker stilt ball, um, kind of a puff ball formation with a, a 
stock on it. There's also a sh desert shaggy mane, which I believe also is another similar structure that and I couldn't find my picture of that one, but um, we find those fairly frequently in the desert. And it's just always surprising to be walking along and, and seeing that. And that concludes my field trip um, down in through the desert. And here's uh, just a group, my sister and myself and my friend Monique all resting up on a ridge and looking down on the back 40. So thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Hello. 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 My daughter has Hello. a greeting for everyone. Hello. Well, thank you, uh, Vicki. That was great. Um, really good, wonderful talk, and um, it's a great place to be living uh, part of the year. Um, I see some people raising your hands. I'd ask you to just go ahead and type your questions into the Q and A, and I'll. And in fact, I'll start with that right now. Uh, David Bartz is asking if, if the elephant tree is a parasite. No, not to my knowledge. No. It's okay, that was an easy one. Um, and Robert Nirenberg, another easy one. Have you eaten mesquite? Have I eaten mesquite? No, I haven't. That's mainly, my, my neighbor makes bread out of it and she's offered it a couple times and I didn't take her up, so. Uh. <laughs> I, will be. I could add, uh, we were introduced to mesquite at our niece's house in Tucson three years ago, and we keep, we've been doing special orders for mesquite flour to, to use, especially for waffles. Which we had. Oh, this good. Week. We even yeah. had some today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're delicious. That's good. We'll have to get some. My neighbor makes it, and then also there's a, we have a little farmer's market that is uh, the Hono Odom. Um, run and uh, they have a, a number of different native foods that I've been meaning to try. It's good. <laughs> Look we'll forward to an ethno botanical uh, talk next year on Arizona. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Robert Nirenberg uh, uh, points out that, you, that May used to be the yellow month, but you said Palo Verde uh, bloom in April now. Is it possibly due to climate change? Um, you know, I don't, I can't really answer that because I have probably not enough experience getting timing on that one, right? This is our first, you know, couple of years of really having enough time where we're here getting a sense of the timing. And before we'd be here for a week or two and hit and miss whether we'd ever hit anything on time. So I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. <laughs> Uh, Robert also uh, asks you to mention the creosote bush smell after a rain. Oh, yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, it, probably one of the most amazing, wonderful smells on the whole planet is stepping outside the door after a rain in the desert. And the creosote bushes give off this amazing aroma that, um, you know, it, you know, creosote's the wrong word for it. It really doesn't smell like creosote. It's kind of... Um, almost a sagey, resiny kind of thing. But if I could bottle it and sell it, boy, I'd be rich. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, and you should bottle it and sell it. Yes. <laughs> and then you'll be rich. <laughs> um, and Linda Bishop is asking if there are any tours to the Ajo area, you know. Any, what was that? Tours, any tours, tours. available. Um, not really. However, um, I am always welcome when I'm down here to, to provide any tours to people. Um, and I would hope one of these days, once COVID's done, I'd like to have a chapter field trip down here. Um, we do have a, a few, there's a, a wonderful inn here that's set up so it can take group, groups of people and uh, is a phenomenal place just in terms of an experience staying in that particular little inn. But uh, there isn't any formalized touring. I have been thinking of setting up my own. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, I imagine uh, the bird watching is pretty good there too, is it not? Yeah, bird watching is not as good as it is like in the Chiricahuas in the Southeast area. Um, there are phenomenal birds here and um, very interesting. And we've got, you know, a huge number of birds that are 
resident birds for the most part with some migration migrants coming through. But uh, it's you know not the birding mecca that you'll have in the Chiricahuas and the, the canyon, the Sky Island areas that are out of Tucson. You mentioned the uh, spaces between the creosote bush. Um, do you know what causes that? Uh, well, part of it is they do have phenochemicals, so they do have some allelopathy in them, and part of that is involved. Competition, probably for moisture it directly, is part of what's going on there. Um, and part of it is just the, I mean, general aridity of that soil type that's sitting there. But, uh, and I think the spacing also is how the plant grows and um, if they do any asexual reproduction, there's a certain distance between the plants. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, there's a question from Robert about migrants. I'm not really sure what that's about. Maybe you can clarify that question, Robert. I'm guessing. <laughs> Paula Clark is saying this is a great treat for a uh, for a native of Tucson, which I assume she is. Okay. <laughs> so she may be, yeah. The migrant question is probably related to the illegal migrant crossing that's in the I, area. I, I'm guessing it doesn't seem really relevant. Yeah, and um, Ajo has been in the heart of that over the yeah. last for quite a number of years. Um, the town is split kind of in terms of their perspective of it, but there's a huge humanitarian kind of movement in terms of a lot of support, at least helping people who need assistance going through. Um, the wall has maybe affected it as it's gone up, but um, I know my husband and I've run across people a few times this year um, and sign of drug cartel action um, that may, makes us a little less happy in, in the area. Um, seems like the crossings that are happening at this time are drug related. More than humanitarian crossing. Yeah. All right. Um, well, is any more questions, please uh, type them into the Q&A. Do you have any plans to uh, expand your trips further afield in Arizona? Any areas uh, farther afield that you're interested in looking at? Uh... Um, yeah, well, we have some camping trips and such planned. We've been headed up north and played around in Mesa a little bit. Uh, or not Mesa. Um, further north. <laughs> um, and uh, we've been poking around there. And we've been down, spent time in outside of Ch Tucson a lot and Chiricahuas down the Southeast, which is phenomenal. Um, different, very different. Um, all good experiences to, to play around in. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, the little sample that I gave you is, you know, kind of the generic desert, but there are definitely areas that are like Patagonia area, there's grasslands, um, and uh, the, the Sky Islands, which are the high island areas where the, uh, basically you have a whole elevational gradient that go up into like uh, behind Tucson, where you have pine forests and fir forests at the top and snow. Yeah. Even the southern area. <laughs> but there can be some pretty different kinds of places. I'm curious if you've seen any um, relatives of plants that you see in the Northwest that surprised you, like, like plants that uh, in that area that look a lot like some plants and are closely related to some plants up here. Yeah, um, well, I guess the ferns <laughs> are kind of the closest. Although they're very different ferns than what we're used to seeing, this the, <clears throat> the club mosses. Um, but beyond that, you know, even the herbaceous plants, I mean, the closest things, you know, sometimes like the, the California poppies, which we get, there's something that kind of overlaps. Uh, <clears throat> some of the annuals are something a little bit more similar to what we'd see, and certainly yeah. more similar to what we'd see on the east side. When I was there uh, in 
couple of years ago, right around this, actually, I guess in May, a few years ago, uh, I went mm -hmm. hiking in one of the Sky Islands area there and came across the Arizona Madrona tree, mm -hmm. which was quite striking to see that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I thought, that's a Madrona. What is it doing here? Yeah. Yeah. When you go up the Sky Islands, that's a different matter. And that will, you will move up into the Northwest. Yeah. So when you get to the top of the mountain, you will feel completely at home. Yeah. You're going to be dealing with ponderosa pine and Douglas fir and um, you work your way through all kinds of junipers on the way up. Um, and the manzanita and the madrone colonies can be pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, Ellen Coleman's asking, what books do you recommend uh, for the local flora in Arizona? Um, let's see. Ron Taylor's book, <laughs> um, The Desert Wildflowers of America. And let's see, there's another one. This just the Noran Desert Wildflower book is really nice. But uh, I don't know if you can see it there. My background is killing it. Um, there is a, a, a taxonomic key, which I still haven't gotten a hold of, which I need to, which would help me. The shrubs here are just evil to figure out. A lot of these shrubs are really difficult. And I'm going to be spending a lot of time working on it. And I have to say, iNaturalist has been a really wonderful resource down here. And there's some really active people that are really good at helping educate you about your, your, your choices and what, uh, what's going on here and, and we'll hand you off keys and things of that order. So I, I definitely endorse uh, high naturalist use down here. Yeah. Uh, Robert, Robert asks, uh, are the firs and the Santa uh, Catalinas like Mount Lemon still there? Uh, I have not been up to the top since the fires but I'm sure there's some that have survived. There was some big fires there two years ago, I think. Um, but I'm sure there, there's some that have persisted up in that area. But yeah, Mount Lemmon's an amazing, yeah, you feel like you're in, you know, at least Eastern, Eastern Washington feel up there. Right. Right. Okay, still looking for questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Linda Bishop has raised her hand, but Linda, if you could just type into the Q&A, that's sort of the, the way we're trying to do things. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to type. I get it. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, if there's not any more questions, then um, I think we'll thank Vicki. Thanks again for, uh, for this. It's such a great talk, and we're looking forward to getting back to you and visiting with you this summer and maybe... Maybe in person a little bit, we hope. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> hopefully. And I got my first COVID vi vi um, vaccine shot several days ago. So good, good. I'm excited about that. Okay. Um, but yeah, again, um, hopefully in the you know near future when COVID is a little bit more under control, that uh, people are welcome to come on down here to Arizona and just get a hold of me and um, can show you around. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Uh, so what we'll do, uh, for those who want to join us for our uh, meeting afterwards, uh, just sort of wait around a bit and we'll promote everybody to, uh, to the panelists and then we can all sort of talk 